The Evolution of Modesty, Part 2, Section 1 of Studies in the Psychology of Sex, Volume 1, by Havelock Ellis. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by John Thomas Coos. The Evolution of Modesty, Part 2, Section 1. That modesty, like all the close allied emotions, is based on fear, one of the most primitive of the emotions, seems to be fairly evident. The association of modesty and fear is even a very ancient observation, and is found in the fragments of Epicharmus, while, according to one of the most recent definitions, modesty is the timidity of the body. Modesty is, indeed, an agglomeration of fears, especially, as I hope to show, of two important and distinct fears, one of much earlier than human origin, and supplied solely by the female, the other of more distinctly human character, and of social rather than sexual origin. A child left to itself, though very bashful, is wholly devoid of modesty. Everyone is familiar with the shocking inconveniences of children in speech and act, with the charming ways in which they innocently disregard the conventions of modesty their elders thrust upon them, or, even when anxious to carry them out, wholly miss the point at issue, as when a child thinks that to put a little garment round the neck satisfies the demands of modesty. Julius Moses states that modesty in the uncovering of the sexual parts begins about the age of four, but in cases when this occurs it is difficult to exclude teaching an example. Under civilized conditions the convention of modesty long precedes its real development. Bell has found that in love affairs before the age of nine the girl is more aggressive than the boy, and that, at that age, she begins to be modest. It may fairly be said that complete development of modesty only takes place at the advent of puberty. We may admit, with Perez, one of the very few writers who touch on the evolution of this emotion, that modesty may appear at a very early age if sexual desire appears early. We should not, however, be justified in asserting that on this account modesty is a purely sexual phenomenon. The social impulses also develop about puberty, and to that coincidence the compound nature of the emotion of modesty may well be largely due. The sexual factor is, however, the simplest and most primitive element of modesty, and may therefore be mentioned first. Anyone who watches a bitch not in heat when approached by a dog with tail wagging gallantly may see the beginnings of modesty. When the dog's attentions become a little too marked, the bitch squats firmly down on the front legs and hind quarters, though when the period of oestrus comes, her modesty may be flung to the air, and she eagerly turns her hind quarters to her admirer's nose and elevates her tail in the air. Her attitude of refusal is equivalent, that is to say, to that which in the human race is typified by the classical example of womanly modesty in the Medician Venus, who withdraws the pelvis, at the same time holding one hand to guard the pubes, the other to guard the breasts. The essential expression in each case is that of defense of the sexual centers against the undesired advances of the male. Strats, who criticizes the above statement, argues, with photographs of nude women in illustration, that the normal type of European surprise modesty is shown by an attitude in which the arms are crossed over the breast, the most sexually attractive region, while the thighs are pressed together, one being placed before the other, the shoulder raised and the back slightly curved. Occasionally, he adds, the hands may be used to cover the face, and then the crossed arms conceal the breasts. The Medician Venus he remarks, is only a pretty woman cocketing with her body. Canova's Venus, in the pity, who has drapery in front of her, and presses her arms across her breast, being a more accurate rendering of the attitude of modesty. But Strats admits that when a surprised woman is gazed at for some time, she turns her head away, 
sinks or closes her eyes and covers her pubes or any other part she thinks is being gazed at with one hand while with the other she hides her breast or face this he terms the secondary expression of modesty strats die Frankling third edition page twenty three this is certainly true that the medician venus merely represents an artistic convention a generalized tradition not founded on exact and precise observation of the gestures of modesty and it is equally true that all the instinctive movements noted by strats are commonly resorted to by a woman whose nakedness is surprised but in the absence of any series of carefully recorded observations one may doubt whether the distinction drawn by strats between the primary and the secondary expression of modesty can be upheld as the general rule while it is most certainly not true for every case when a young woman is surprised in a state of nakedness by a person of the opposite or even of the same sex it is her instinct to conceal the primary centers of sexual function and attractiveness in the first place the pubes, in the second place, the breasts. The exact attitude and particular gestures of the hands in achieving the desired end vary with the individual and with the circumstances. The hand may not be used at all as a veil, and indeed the instinct of modesty itself may inhibit the use of the hand for the protection of modesty. To turn the back towards the beholder is often the chief impulse of blushing modesty, even when clothed. But the application of the hand to this end is primitive and natural. The lowly Fuyan woman, depicted by Hyades and Deneker, who holds her hand to her pubes while being photographed, is one at this point with the Roman Venus described by Ovid, Ars Amoratoria, Book Two. Ipsa Venus pubem quotis valemnia ponit protegutur leva semi reducta manus. It may be added that young women of the lower social classes, at all events in England, when bathing at the seaside in complete nudity, commonly grasp the sexual organs with one hand for concealment as they walk up from the sea. The sexual modesty of the female animal is rooted in the sexual periodicity of the female, and is an involuntary expression of the organic fact that the time for love is not now. Inasmuch as this fact is true of the greater part of the lives of all female animals below man, the expression itself becomes so habitual that it even intrudes at those moments when it has ceased to be in place. We may see this again illustrated in the bitch who, when in heat, herself runs after the male and again turns to flee, perhaps only submitting with much persuasion to his embrace. Thus modesty becomes something more than a mere refusal of the male, it becomes an invitation to the male, and is mixed up with his ideas of what is sexually desirable in the female. This would alone serve to account for the existence of modesty as a psychical secondary sexual character. In this sense, and in the sense only, we may say, with Colin Scott, that the feeling of shame is made to be overcome, and is thus correlated with its physical representative, the hymen, in the rupture of which, as Groose remarks, there is, in some degree, a disruption also of modesty. The sexual modesty of the female is thus an inevitable by-product of the naturally aggressive attitude of the male in sexual relationships, and the naturally defensive attitude of the female, this again being founded on the fact that while in man and the species allied to him the sexual function in the female is periodic and during most of life a function to be guarded from the opposite sex in the male it rarely or never needs to be so guarded both male and female however need to guard themselves during the exercise of their sexual activities from jealous rivals as well as from enemies who might take advantage of their position to attack them it is highly probable that this is one important sexual factor in the constitution of modesty and shuns publicity in the exercise of sexual functions Northcote has especially emphasized this element in modesty as originating in the fear of rivals. 
that from this seeking after secrecy from motives of fear should arise an instinctive feeling that the sexual act must always be hidden is a natural enough sequence and since it is not a long step between thinking of an act as needing concealment and thinking of it as wrong it is easily conceivable that sexual intercourse comes to be regarded as a stolen and therefore in some degree a sinful pleasure animals in a state of nature almost appear to seek seclusion for sexual intercourse although this instinct is lost under domestication even the lowest savages also if uncorrupted by civilized influences seek the solitude of the forest or the protection of their huts for the same purpose the rare cases in which coitus is public seem usually to involve a ceremonial or social observance rather than mere personal gratification at loango for instance it would be highly improper to have intercourse in an exposed spot it must only be performed inside the hut with closed doors at night when no one is present it is on the sexual factor of modesty existing in a well-marked form even among animals that coquetry is founded i am glad to find myself on this point in agreement with professor Groose, who in his elaborate study of the play instinct has reached the same conclusion so far from being the mere heartless play by which a woman shows her power over a man Groose points out that coquetry possesses high biological and psychological significance being rooted in the antagonism between the sexual instinct and inborn modesty he refers to the roe who runs away from the stag but in a circle grus die spiel der menschen eighteen ninety nine page three three nine also the same authors die spiel der fier page two eighty eight at sequence another example of coquetry is furnished by the female kingfisher alcido ispida which will spend all the morning in teasing and flying away from the male but is careful constantly to look back and never to let him out of her sight many examples are given by buchner in leib and leibesleben in der terwelt robert muller sexual biology page 302 emphasizes the importance of coquetry as a lure to the male it is quite true a lady writes to me in a private letter that coquetry is a poor thing and that every milkmaid can assume it but a woman uses it principally in self-defense while she is finding out what the man himself is like this is in accordance with the remark of marrow that modesty enables a woman to put lovers to the test in order to select him who is best able to serve the natural ends of love it is doubtless the necessity for this probationary period as a test of masculine qualities which usually leads a woman to repel instinctively a too hasty and impatient suitor for as arthur macdonald remarks it seems to be instinctive in young women to reject the impetuous lover without the least consideration of his character ability and fitness this essential element in courtship this fundamental attitude of pursuer and pursued is clearly to be seen even in animals and savages it is equally pronounced in most civilized men and women manifesting itself in crude and subtle ways alike shakespeare's angelo whose virtue had always resisted the temptations of vice discovered at last that modesty may more betray our sense than woman's lightness what asked the wise montaigne is the object of that virginal shame that sedate coldness that severe countenance that pretense of not knowing things which they understand better than we who teach them except to increase in us the desire to conquer and curb to trample under our appetite all that ceremony and those obstacles for there is not only matter for pleasure but for pride also in ruffling and debauching that soft sweetness and infantine modesty the masculine attitude in the face of feminine coyness may easily pass into a kind of sadism but is nevertheless in its origin an innocent and instinctive impulse restif de la breton describing his own shame and timidity as a pretty boy whom the girls would run after and kiss adds 
it is surprising that at the same time i would imagine the pleasure i should have in embracing a girl who resisted in inspiring her with timidity in making her flee and in pursuing her that was a part which i burned to play it is the instinct of the sophisticated and the unsophisticated alike the arabs have developed an erotic ideal of sensuality but they emphasize the importance of feminine modesty and declare that the best woman is she who sees not men and whom they see not this deep-rooted modesty of women towards men in courtship is intimately interwoven with the marriage customs and magic rites of even the most primitive peoples and has survived in many civilized practices to-day a prostitute may be able to simulate the modesty she may often be far from feeling and the immense erotic advantage of the innocent over the vicious woman lies largely in the fact that in her the exquisite reactions of modesty are fresh and vigorous i cannot imagine anything that is more sexually exciting remarks hans menjago than to observe a person of the opposite sex who by some external or internal force is compelled to fight against her physical modesty the more modest she is the more sexually exciting is the person she presents it is notable that even in abnormal as well as in normal erotic passion the desire is for innocent and not for vicious women and in association with this the desired favor to be keenly relished must often be gained by sudden surprise and not by mutual agreement a foot fetishist writes to me it is the stolen glimpse of a pretty foot or ankle which produces the greatest effect on me a urologic symbolist was chiefly excited by the act of urination when he caught a young woman unawares in the act a fetishist admirer of the states only desired to see this region in innocent girls not in prostitutes the exhibitionist almost invariably only exposes himself to apparently respectable girls a russian correspondent who feels this charm of women in a particularly strong degree is inclined to think that there is an element of perversity in it in the erotic action of the idea of feminine enjoyment he writes i think there are traces of a certain perversity in fact owing to the impressions of early youth woman even if we feel contempt for her in theory is placed above us on a certain pedestal as an almost sacred being and the more so because mysterious now sensuality and sexual desire are considered as rather vulgar and a little dirty even ridiculous and degrading not to say bestial the woman who enjoys it is therefore rather like a profaned altar or at least like a divinity who has descended on to the earth to give enjoyment to a woman is therefore like perpetrating a sacrilege or at least like taking a liberty with a god the feelings bequeathed to us by a long social civilization maintain themselves in spite of our rational and deliberate opinions reason tells us that there is nothing evil in sexual enjoyment rather in man or woman but an unconscious feeling directs our emotions and this feeling having a germ that was placed in modern men by christianity and perhaps by still older religions says that woman ought to be an absolutely pure being with ethereal sensations and that in her sexual enjoyment is out of place improper scandalous to arouse sexual emotions in a woman if not to profane a sacred host is at all events the staining of an immaculate peplos if not sacrilege it is at least irreverence or impertinence for all men the chaster a woman is the more agreeable it is to bring her to the orgasm that is felt as a triumph of the body over the soul of sin over virtue of earth over heaven there is something diabolic in such pleasure especially when it is felt by a man intoxicated with love and full of religious respect for the virgin of his election this feeling is from a rational point of view absurd and in its tendencies immoral but it is delicious in its sacredly voluptuous subtlety defloration thus has its powerful fascination in the respect consciously or unconsciously felt for woman's chastity in marriage the feeling is yet more complicated in deflowering his bride the christian that is any man brought up in a christian civilization has the feeling of committing a sort of sin for the flesh is for him always connected with sin which by a special privilege 
has for him become legitimate. He has received a special permit to corrupt innocence. Hence the peculiar prestige for civilized Christians of the wedding night sung by Shelley in ecstatic verses. O oh joy, O oh fear, what will be done in the absence of the sun? This feeling has, however, its normal range, and is not, per se, a perversity, though it may doubtless become so when unduly heightened by Christian sentiment, and especially if it leads, as to some extent, it has led, in my Russian correspondent, to an abnormal feeling of sexual attraction of girls who have only or scarcely reached the age of puberty. The sexual charm of this period of girlhood is well illustrated in many of the poems of Thomas Ashe, and is worthy of note as perhaps supporting the contention that this attraction is based on Christian feeling, that Ashe has been a clergyman. An attentiveness to the woman's pleasure remains, in itself, very far from a perversion, but increases, as Colin Scott has pointed out, with civilization, while its absence, the indifference to the partner's pleasure, is a perversion of the most degraded kind. There is no such instinctive demand on the woman's part for innocence in the man, in the nature of things that could not be. Such emotion is required for properly playing the part of the pursued. It is by no means an added attraction on the part of the pursuer. There is, however, an allied and corresponding desire which is very often clearly or latently present in the woman, a longing for pleasure that is stolen or forbidden. It is a mistake to suppose that this is an indication of viciousness or perversity. It appears to be an impulse that occurs quite naturally in altogether innocent women. The exciting charm of the risky and dangerous naturally arises on a background of feminine shyness and timidity. We may trace its recognition at a very early stage of history, in the story of Eve and the forbidden fruit, that has so often been the symbol of the masculine organs of sex. It is on this ground that many have argued the folly of laying external restrictions on women in matters of love. Thus, in quoting the great Italian writer, who afterwards became Pope Pius II, Robert Burton remarked, I am of Aeneas Silvius's mind. Those jealous Italians do very ill to lock up their wives, for women are of such a disposition, they will mostly covet that which is denied most, and offend least when they have free liberty to trespass. It is the spontaneous and natural instinct of the lover to desire modesty in his mistress, and by no means any calculated opinion on his part that modesty is the sign of sexual emotion. It remains true, however, that modesty is an expression of feminine erotic impulse. We have here one of the instances, of which there are so many, of that curious and instinctive harmony by which nature has sought the more effectively to bring about the ends of courtship. As to the fact itself, there can be little doubt. It constantly forces itself on the notice of careful observers, and has long been decided, in the affirmative, by those who have discussed the matter. Vinet, one of the earliest writers on the psychology of sex, after discussing the question at length, decided that the timid woman is a more ardent lover than the bold woman. It is the most prudent girl remarked Restif de la Breton, whose experience of women was so extensive. The girl who blushes most, who is most disposed to the pleasures of love, he adds, that in girls and boys alike, shyness is a premature consciousness of sex. This observation has even become embodied in popular proverbs. Do as the lasses do, say no, but take it is a Scotch saying, to which corresponds the Welsh saying, the more prudish, the more unchaste. It 
is not at first quite clear why an excessively shy and modest woman should be the most apt for intimate relationships with a man and in such a case the woman is often charged with hypocrisy there is however no hypocrisy in the matter the shy and reserved woman holds herself aloof from intimacy in ordinary friendship because she is acutely sensitive to the judgments of others and fears that any seemingly immodest action may make an unfavorable opinion with a lover however in whose eyes she feels assured that her actions cannot be viewed unfavorably these barriers of modesty fall down and the resulting intimacy becomes all the more fascinating to the woman because of its contrast with the extreme reserve she is impelled to maintain in other relationships it thus happens that many modest women who in non-sexual relationships with their own sex are not able to act with the physical unreserve not uncommon with women among themselves yet feel no such reserve with a man when they are once confident of his good opinion much the same is true of modest and sensitive men in their relations with women this fundamental animal factor of modesty rooted in the natural facts of the sexual life of the higher mammals and especially man obviously will not explain all the phenomena of modesty we must turn to the other great primary element of modesty the social factor we cannot doubt that one of the most primitive and universal of the social characteristics of man is an aptitude for disgust founded as it is on a yet more primitive and animal aptitude for disgust which has little or no social significance in nearly all races even the most savage we seem to find distinct traces of this aptitude for disgust in the presence of certain actions of others an emotion naturally reflected in the individual's own actions and hence a guide to conduct notwithstanding our gastric community of disgust with lower animals it is only in man that this disgust seems to become transformed and developed to possess a distinctly social character and to serve as a guide to social conduct the objects of disgust vary infinitely according to the circumstances and habits of particular races but the reaction of disgust is fundamental throughout the best study of the phenomena of disgust known to me is without doubt professor richette's richette concludes that it is the dangerous and the useless which evoke disgust the digestive and sexual excretions and secretions being either useless or in accordance with widespread primitive ideas highly dangerous the genitoanal region became a concentrated focus of disgust it is largely for this reason no doubt that savage men exhibit modesty not only toward women but toward their own sex and that so many of the lowest savages take great precautions in obtaining seclusion for the fulfillment of natural functions the statement now so often made that the primary object of clothes is to accentuate rather than to conceal has in it as i shall point out later a large element of truth but it is by no means a complete account of the matter it seems difficult not to admit that alongside the impulse to accentuate sexual differences there is also in both men and women a genuine impulse to concealment among the most primitive peoples and the invincible repugnance often felt by savages to remove the girdle or apron is scarcely accounted for by the theory that it is solely a sexual lure in this connection it seems to me instructive to consider a special form of modesty very strongly marked among savages in some parts of the world i refer to the feeling of immodesty in eating where this feeling exists modesty is offended when one eats in public the modest man retires to eat 
indecency said cook was utterly unknown among the tahitians but they would not eat together even brothers and sisters had their separate baskets of provisions and generally sat some yards apart with their backs to each other when they ate the warua of central africa cameron found when offered a drink put up a cloth before their faces while they swallowed it and would not allow any one to see them eat or drink so that every man or woman must have his own fire and cook for himself Carl von den steinen remarks in his interesting book on brazil that though the bakairi of central brazil have no feeling of shame about nakedness they are ashamed to eat in public they retire to eat and hung their heads in shamefaced confusion when they saw him innocently eat in public rolf von stevens found that when he gave an orang lot malay woman anything to eat she not only would not eat it if her husband were present but if any man were present she would go outside before eating or giving her children to eat thus among these people the act of eating in public produces the same feelings as among ourselves the indecent exposure of the body in public it is quite easy to understand how this arises whenever there is any pressure on the means of substance as among savages at some time or another there nearly always is it must necessarily arouse a profound and mixed emotion of desire and disgust to see another person putting into his stomach what might just as well have put into one's own the special secrecy sometimes observed by women is probably due to the fact that women would be less able to resist the emotions that the act of eating would arouse in onlookers as social feeling develops a man desires not only to eat in safety but also to avoid being an object of disgust and to spare his friends all unpleasant emotions hence it becomes a requirement of ordinary decency to eat in private a man who eats in public becomes like the man who in our cities exposes his person in public an object of disgust and contempt end of the evolution of modesty part two section one recording by john thomas coos kuzmarski john thomas coos www.validateyourlife.com